This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. When the jury panel comes into the courtroom and the bailiff says, all rise, I know we're here. And it doesn't matter who they are, nobody should be above the law. A lot of us talk about that, but you've actually done it. That's how you also maintain quality control over your practice. Yeah. That's a question I get asked a lot, and here's the answer. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. Uh, today, I have our firm's in-house marketing director, Delisi Friday, and we're going to talk about uh, what we're doing to market our firm uh, because we were going through and uh, planning our 2020, reviewing our 2019 what worked, what didn't work, and we thought, man, this might be interesting to some other people that are trying to get cases, because we talk a lot about with what to do once you get the case, but if you don't have a good case to work on, it doesn't matter how good of a lawyer you are. So how are you doing today, Lisey? Good. How are you? I'm doing all right. So since you're my guru on this stuff, I uh, want to talk to you about, you know, where we are, despite the fact that we are constantly doing a ton of things for marketing, we've been spending a lot of time this last few weeks just really assessing, you know, what is it we've been doing, what's it cost us, and what good has it done us? Uh, why is it important, do you think, to assess your marketing efforts every year or, or periodically? I think it's important for a few reasons. First, you have to find out, is something working? Um, second, you need to assess it before you don't have a chance to make it work. So if you're in the middle of a marketing strategy, you see it's not working, but you've already discussed that maybe there's something you can do to pivot and make it work, it's important to assess it soon enough to do that. Um, and then also to figure out whether or not it's working and you should continue to do it, or maybe you should be doing something else instead of that. Or double down on what's working. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's one thing that, and I've been guilty of this, even though I've learned about it, there's something called the sunk cost fallacy where once you put time, effort, money into something, you keep doing it even though, because you've already spent so much time, money, and effort, even though if it's not working, your future efforts would be better off somewhere else. Uh, and I think an example of that is our magazine. Uh, we've been doing for a couple of years now, like a beautiful, and you write great articles, and it looks gorgeous, uh, Thank you. monthly magazine. We've been sending it out to over 1,600 lawyers, but... It's not successful yeah. in the fact that it's not bringing us in cases, which is why we do that. Exactly. Everyone told us how much they loved it and how much it made us look good, but it hasn't. We did, the, we did it, and we talked to our top referrers about how they heard about us. Uh, we can't point to really any cases or maybe one case that was from that, and so we looked at, you know, assuming it was that one case, what did that one case bring in versus what was the expense of producing and printing and mailing out 1600 magazines a month it just didn't make sense to continue doing it well and you mentioned the other day you said it's excellent branding but is the branding bringing in a case yep so at what point do you say that's great branding but if it's not bringing me in a case then why am i spending the money yeah and it's one thing if we'd quit after three months but after two years you know yeah, we gave it a good shot we gave it a good shot you know and so everyone who liked the magazine i'm sorry um you know, it was fun. We liked doing it, but uh, since it didn't inspire anyone to refer us big cases, we just <laughs> yeah. can't. You know, we just can't. Doesn't make any sense to, to spend the money if I'm just going to go waste five or six thousand dollars a month. I can think of some much more enjoyable ways to do it than sending out a magazine. Well, and that's the fun and also the scary part about marketing because we can do something fun that we think is going to be really great and bring us in cases, but the scary part is it might not. So. That's just what marketing is. Yeah, and I think sometimes you have to do, you know, 10 things to find the one or two that work. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, the good thing in our business, you know, personal injury cases, the margins are high enough and the fees are high enough where you can afford to take chances and experiment. And, uh, yes. Whereas like a grocery store working on a 1% margin or, you know, it's much harder for them. So what are some things that, you know, we do at our firm uh, to track whether or not marketing is working? So we do a couple of things. Um, first, we track all of the leads that come into our system. And I think one of the great things that we did this year is we changed the way we tracked it 
for those of our listeners who use needles, we used to create all of our intakes and needles, give it a case number, and then close it out if we rejected it. But what we did this year was, and it sounds really simple, but we just created an Excel spreadsheet. And we wrote down every referral that came in, and then we took notes on what was happening with that referral and if we accepted or rejected it. Um, and that's how we, we tracked what we were doing. Yeah, one w- big weakness and with a lot for our practice, which is referral attorney of referral-based practice rather than people calling into us. Uh, one big weakness we had is that needles and other case management systems, to even create an intake, you don't have to create a whole case, but to even create an intake, you have to have someone's name. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And a lot of times, it's, I ran into so-and-so at the courthouse, they told me about this kind of case, I don't know the client's name, I don't know any details, I just know we need to follow up with this lawyer to see whether or not this is a case we want to take or not. Mm-hmm. Or a lot of times, I spoke to so-and-so about a case, I don't want it, but we still needed to, so there's no point in asking for all the client information yeah. on a case we don't want. It's going to be an really awkward conversation to have, too. Yeah. So, hey, are you interested in this medical malpractice case? No, I don't do medical malpractice, but can you give me the client's name just in case so I can have it from my database? I mean, that doesn't work. I mean, it would be offensive and weird. Well, and it also gave me a chance to figure out who's emailing you all those cases or who's texting you, or do you get more cases when you see someone in person? So it, it had that effect as well. Absolutely. And then, you know, it also keeps things from falling through the cracks. So when I just run into somebody in the hallway, if I tell you about it, then you guys are really good about bugging me. Like, what about this one? Mm -hmm. Have you followed up? Yes. I'm not the best at that without help. And so what are some of the things you've learned now that, you know, you've seen a, got a better feel for, you know, where it's, where our business is coming from? So one of the things I really enjoyed about tracking our leads differently this year is I could see when we were getting referrals from someone new and when we were getting referrals that came after a seminar. So this year we did a great job of being out and about and speaking at different seminars throughout the year. So when we were tracking, I was able to see if there was someone new who came after a seminar, which happened this year. And so when that happened, I could see the types of cases that they were referring to us. And if it wasn't something we could accept, then I could have you or Sonia or Mallory send a note saying, hey, thank you so much for your referral. These are the types of cases that we accept. So the next time they refer something, it's something we might accept. Yeah, that's one thing I've learned that we just have to do, and, and not to be ashamed to ask, is say, this is these are the cases we take, and these are the cases we don't take, and just to be real clear, this is what we would like. Because uh, I found it both ways. One, people still call us on medical negligence cases, and mm-hmm. I've, I respect people that do them. They need to be done, but uh, since Texas had our tort reform in 2003 and made those very hard to make money on, I don't do them anymore. So it's been 16 years since I've done one. Um, but yet people still send them over on a regular basis. On the other hand, some of our top referring lawyers thought that my standards on trucking cases were higher than they actually are, that we would only take catastrophic yeah. injury or death cases. And luckily I'd had lunch with the guy and explained to him that, you know, we would have lost out on some good cases that are, you know, mid six figure cases because he thought that we were too big for our britches or, you know, we weren't taking those anymore. Uh, so it's, I think, really important to just not to be ashamed to say this is what I want and this is what I don't want and just put in writing and let people know. Well, and I think from a marketing perspective, you should always do that. Even if people are consistently referring you cases, you should still remind them what you take and what you don't take um, just in case saying that helps them refer you another case they didn't think of. Yep. The one thing that really, and I knew this, but it really reiterated to me when we really looked through you know, we had the best year we've ever had at the firm this year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was after doing a, an extensive marketing effort for two years. And so the initial thought was, well, it's because we're doing all this marketing, it's great. But then when we dug and we tore into the numbers, we found that the sources of these cases that made us do so great uh, were lawyers that were referring us cases. And we, we'd had long established relationships prior to us doing any kind of major marketing back when I was just, you know, doing lunch and beers with people. Yep. Uh, and so it really caused us to reassess, you know, for next year, we're going to put more of our efforts on keeping the people we already do business with happy uh, and maybe a little less on spreading the news to the I mean, you still want other people to know who you are, try to get new business, but keeping your existing sources of business and maintaining your existing relationships is so much more important because, you know, it just for a lawyer to refer another lawyer a big case, you know, they're not going to do it just because they saw a pretty piece of paper or got an email yeah. from you but they're going to do it because you know they're going to have done their research typically they're going to ask other lawyers uh 
they met you before and how did you how do they perceive you so i think that tending to those personal relationships and not taking them for granted either oh, absolutely. Uh, is, is so much more important than anything else and i think trying to learn to be systematic because you know if, when we don't track it i'll go three months and not purposely without talking to one of our important referral partners because i'll be so busy working on the cases uh that i just forget to go market mm-hmm. and i think that also is a great example of why it's so important to reassess what your marketing efforts are and how they're working because we wouldn't have known that unless we were actually doing our homework and trying to figure out where are these cases coming from yeah uh, the other uh, uh, the other thing is that being picky on what we took really made a huge difference and we saw that because now we are turning cases more quickly and for more money and that's something that we can then use to tell our existing referral partners yes we're not taking you know we've narrowed the scope of what we take but look at what a better result we're getting for you look how much you know you're getting a bigger check you're getting it faster you've got happier clients well and i think you've mentioned it a few times on this podcast how we did that and i think it's important to note that it didn't happen overnight you made the decision for us not to do pre-lit how long ago was it <sighs> four years maybe I feel like maybe it was three. Three or four years ago. Something like that. But it didn't happen overnight. I mean, once you make that decision, it takes time to get those pre cases out. Then it takes time to settle the other ones. So I feel like the decisions you made years back are reaping rewards now. Yeah, but then it was that short term. Like when I decided we weren't going to do the normal auto cases. We're only Mm going to do commercial motor vehicle cases unless it was a case with a policy that was at least, I think, 500000 or something Mm -hmm. that's like a commercial policy. Uh, it was scary because we made money on those smaller cases. Uh, I mean, we were bringing in quite a few of them. They would settle without a whole lot of work. It was a steady income stream. But it also took time away because no matter how many other people you hire, I kept having to get involved at some level because people want to get to the top. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it would take me away from working on the bigger ones. So, you know, it was a short-term pain. Uh, but, you know, and we and we had to keep doing the math. If it hadn't worked, we would have had to pivot back. and. Yeah. And do that. Another thing I've learned about, uh, you know, when we're looking at marketing efforts, is remembering that what we do to try to get new cases does not alienate our current sources of cases. Absolutely. And one example is, you know, we wanted to get better online reviews for some reason, uh, and so you know, we were when we did a good job for a client, we just said, hey, if you don't mind, could you go do an online review? One of our referral partners didn't like that because they wanted the online reviews mm-hmm. and. Honestly, the online review is more valuable for them because they're advertising to the general public uh, than to us. And so what we do now is on that one referral partner, we say we don't ask those clients to do an online review. We say if you are happy, we review the referring lawyer and give him a good review. Uh, So we give him what he wants because we're more likely to get another case from a lawyer that that advertises and has a bunch of cases than we are from the you know, someone randomly Googling us and seeing that we got a good review. Well, and so the reason we did that was for social proof. And also because we want our referral attorneys to bring us in on a case and for their client to look us up and feel comfortable hiring us because we can talk all we want about ourselves, but the best testimonial is from a client. And I also think it's probably, and more and more will be the case that one of the things people are going to do to do their due diligence before they refer a case out to another lawyer is to look at the online reviews Mm -hmm. because you know if you're not delivering a good customer experience even if you get good money at the end of the case that will hurt the referring lawyer's relationship with the client they'll tell other people about it uh you know even if you have a peer referral based practice like we do you still have to keep the clients really happy because yep. if the ref- client goes back to the referring lawyer complaining about you, they're not going to want to send another case because you're supposed to be solving their problems, not causing more problems. Well, and who's more likely to leave a testimonial? Someone who's really happy who we have to ask like three times or someone who's upset who's going to leave a really long thread talking about how upset they are about the case? Yeah, we, we found that out. We did. <laughs> uh, well, Actually, I think that's how the testimonial uh, project came about was someone did that. Yeah, because there was one case and there was a bill we didn't know about and the guy got a ton of money and we didn't pay that one bill and then he spent all the money and then got a collection notice on that one bill mm-hmm. and then blamed us. And it's like, yeah. he didn't tell us about it. We had him sign off. These are the bills we're paying. Any other bills in your thing? He got, you know, multiple six figures of money. And it was a bill in the hundreds of dollars, not even a thousand dollars, but all of a sudden because we wouldn't go pay that bill out of our pockets, we're the bad guys. Well, and then from a marketing perspective, when I saw that, 
I can't respond in the way I really want to respond because I'm upset someone's going to say something bad about us because right. we worked so hard on his case. But you can't argue with crazy online either because then you look just as crazy. And you don't want to reveal, you know, client confidences. There are some yep. bar opinions saying once they bring it up, you're allowed to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's better to... Uh, look classy and then like i said we have one bad review and we have tons of great reviews and yep. so you know i know when i'm looking at a restaurant let's say i'll give you an example i went out last weekend uh, we some were referring lawyers came in town also my brother-in-law and his girlfriend came in town and so we had a little dinner and i was looking at restaurants There's an incredible seafood restaurant called rebel mallory had recommended it so i'm looking at the online reviews and most of them are you know five star four star five star five star and then every now and then there's like a one or two star in there. But you read them closely, it's just someone that doesn't want to spend the money or someone yeah. that, that doesn't feel comfortable at a high-end restaurant, mm -hmm. but yet they're rating it low because it is what it is. I mean, it's too it, – yes, it is expensive. Yes, you know, it, it is – you know, what did someone call it uh, – Teenage Vampire Prom or something. <laughs> I mean, it's got you know. It's a weird description. <laughs> it is, but it's a it's a it, you know they have like a, like a lion statue with like little mirrors on. It's it's a different. The, oh, the, is it at St. Anthony Hotel? Yeah, the chairs okay. are clear plastic. I mean, it's a yeah. different. It's for it's a, a different vibe, someone. but it was awesome, and I you know so I didn't because there was very few reviews, and when I read them, it was clearly like okay, this person is they're just not yeah. the right fit for the restaurant. No, you know I still went, and I still loved it. And that's what I do. You know, Yelp is my I travel so much. Uh, Yelp, if someone has more than 100 Yelp reviews and they're 95% positive, you know, that's someplace I'll go eat. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it is for us, too. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what is it that we looked at then when we're trying to decide, okay, you know, we, we target, because we're doing lawyer to lawyer, we, we specifically target certain people, uh, certain groups, you know, certain lists of people. Mm -hmm. What is it you look at as to whether or not to keep someone on the list for next year or whether or not to kind of, you know, move on? You know, you don't want to be the stalker. Like, okay, yeah. like she said no five times. If I keep calling her now, that's like crossing the line to yeah. maybe five, maybe once, but that's a whole other story. So that was something that I struggled with this year for us because the hard part for us and also for marketing in general is you don't know where that next case is going to come from. Yeah. So you put your marketing efforts in different categories. So maybe there's category number one for us which would be the attorney who's spending a lot of money in marketing and needs us to help on a handful of those really big cases. And then there's, you know, category number two, who's going to be someone who's a solo practitioner. They're going to have a couple of big cases they need help on, and that's, that's our category number two. And then there's what I call category number three, and it's someone who practices a lot of different types of law and you're just not sure if they get that one trucking case. Are they going to need help with it and are they going to call us? Um, so those were kind of the three different categories I had for our marketing efforts. And you have category four, which is someone that gets the cases and has no desire mm -hmm. or need to refer them out. And those people you can be friends with, you know, answer questions, share information, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of money marketing to them when you realize that, you know, we can be friends, but we're not going to do business together. So yeah. You know, if you guys want to go on a fishing trip, you can pay your half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and plus, you never know who you're going to work with on a case. There have been some cases where we work with two or three other plaintiff attorneys because there's so many people involved in a case. Yeah. But we don't necessarily need to spend money no, on you know, making them. absolutely not. No. And so how often do you go through and review our, our mailing lists? So we review our mailing list every month. First, we review it every month for addresses that come back because obviously attorneys move and, and they have a new address for their business. So we look every month for that reason. But then when it comes to our email list, I always look at our email list once a month as well and just see if there are any people on that email list who have changed businesses or I catch and aren't someone I want to market to. Like, I'll give you an example. I have no idea why, and they must have been on there for a long time, but we sent out our monthly email to someone who works at Jackson Walker. And I'm like, Jackson Walker? Jackson Walker is never going to give us a case. How are they on there? Yeah, they're a big uh, corporate forum. Yeah, firm. they're they're a big defense firm. They're not going to send us any business, so I took them off the list. So I do look at it every month, um, and I think it is something that you should look at every month, whether you do direct mail or you do emails. Um, I know a lot of our fans are going to be someone who do a monthly email, 
and that's something you should definitely be looking at every month to see is that someone I should still be emailing or um, is it someone who's now disengaged because when you do mass emails you can see has someone blocked you has someone not answered or not opened up your emails for several months so then you have to decide is it even worth sending the email anymore um, or is there something else I should be doing here right, which is less of a concern I think with email that doesn't mm -hmm. cost any money to spend one more email but when you're doing print I mean that adds yep. up real quick absolutely I think one of the hard things for me this year was we have people on our list who are immigration attorneys and I had this internal battle with myself where I thought you know I look at our demographics of the clients that we have and a huge percentage of the clients that we have are Hispanics who are Spanish speaking only so on one hand I'm thinking well those are the attorneys who have our client demographics so are they going to refer us a case and then I think about the cases we have where it is someone who um, maybe is a Mexican national who got into an accident here in the United States should we be marketing to them so that was something this year internally I kind of battled with is are they worth sending our marketing materials to right and that's I and mean, at first, oh, at first we're saying, well, send to everybody. They might send mm -hmm. something. But then we started looking at, okay, how many thousands of dollars are we spending yeah. sending them to everybody versus after two years, what kind of return are we getting? Mm -hmm. You know, would we be better off, you know, minimizing that spend and maybe doing something more for the people we already have a relationship with uh, and then really targeting, you know, people who would be maybe open to having, like, you know, someone that attends yeah. one of our free seminars. Uh, and again, there's no, for those of you listening, if you want to go to one of the seminars, there's never an obligation to refer, there's not an expectation to refer, but at the same time, if you go to one of our seminars and you thought that I knew what I was talking about, you may be more likely to think of me on the next case, and so I should do something to let you know this is what I do, if you want to work with me, this is how we can, we can uh, get in touch, and you know, things that I would welcome the chance to work with you. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think that's crossing the line at no. all. Mm -mm. Uh, and whereas, you know, there's someone's been on the list for two or three years has never reached out at some, yes, maybe if we kept it on the list 10 years, that one case would come in. But you know, when you look at the number of people you have to send stuff to, and then the amount of work it takes to send out something someone will actually read, yeah, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Well, and I feel like that is indicative of where we are in our marketing strategies right now. So we have done things for one year or two years, so now we're at a point where we have to say, do we continue doing it or do we not do it anymore? Because you want to give it enough time to work, because not every marketing strategy is going to work right away. Right. But at the same time, you also can't burn money. So right. you have to constantly be assessing what's working and what's not. Especially if you can take that same money, uh, and if you still want to spend it on marketing, you know, give some incredible experiences to those people that you do a lot of business with mm -hmm. so that they will, okay, so if I work refer a case to this person, not only will they work hard on the case, pay attention to it, keep my client happy, give me a big check at the end and maybe more quickly than someone else would, uh, but they also found out what my favorite band was and flew me to the city where they were playing and got me a VIP experience with that band and took me to a great dinner. and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just find extra little special things we could do for the people, you know, as a way to say thank you for yeah. for what they've done to us. Those uh, personal us. relationships are invaluable, and I think um, that's really an important part of our marketing strategy. Although I found that m even more important than the big the big gestures like that is just time. Just mm -hmm. the people that, if you have a referral relationship with somebody, you just have to go and give them FaceTime. Just go buy and have lunch go by and say hi and see how someone's doing yep. uh, and you don't have to ask for a case it's just you have to maintain that relationship and it's like a marriage if, if you never have date night you know I think you know if you never ask your wife out somebody else will uh, <laughs> you know you, you, you if you just take if you take someone for granted and you yeah. don't show the love then there's you know 50 other people out there wanting to show them the love. Uh, well, and realistically, there are 50 other people who would want to show our referral attorneys love, so we can't take it for granted yeah, there at are, all. Yeah, there are lots of other great firms in Texas, and mm -hmm. uh, and we have to respect them, and a lot of those lawyers do a wonderful job. So, you know, how do we differentiate ourselves? You know, we try to with the results, but there's also a lot of other lawyers who get great results, so we try to do it on the, the experience and the relationship. I think the customer experience isn't just for our clients in our cases, but also our referral attorneys. 
Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking, commercial motor vehicle, and product liability cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We would be honored to review the case in detail, discuss where we believe we can add value, and create a mutually beneficial partnership. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. And now, back to the show. Yeah, that was a big lesson for me is the, the you know, going back, and I think when, when we started doing surveys of our referring lawyers mm-hmm. uh, and, and figuring out what is the referral lawyer experience, because the biggest complaint we have is someone and not just with us, but saying with other firms that they would, they would send a case over, and then they would hear nothing, and then until they got a check or got a phone call saying there was a problem with the case, they're going to have to settle cheap. And I didn't know people did this, or even we need to redo the deal because the case wasn't as good as we did. So I need to. Not only is it not going to be a great settlement, but I need you to take a smaller percentage because I did a lot of work on it. You would never do that. I would not. That's stupid. Don't no. do that. Don't do it. <laughs> Keep your word. <laughs> you, it's even if you lose money on this case, the relationship is worth so much more. Your integrity is worth so much more. Yeah, but the uh, the relationship, the the if you look at the lifetime value of a customer, so in personal injury, most of our clients aren't going to keep coming back. I mean, right. you know, there's only going to be so many bad injuries someone's going to get that are the, the fault of some other solvent person. And once you've had a couple, I mean, the pre-existing conditions would ruin your case anyway. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you get a relationship with a, with another lawyer uh, that refer that gets cases that refers out, you know, some some people don't like to do litigation, some people do litigation to a certain extent, but then when it gets to a certain level of expense or complexity, they'd like someone to team up with. Uh, when you find those people, they're worth their weight in gold, and because you will be getting cases from, we have people that we've been getting cases from for 19 years. Wow. Uh, and. You know, we've been able to maintain those relationships. and But part of that is, you know, what kind of experience do they have working with you? Have you kept them informed as mm-hmm. to what's going on? Do they feel valued? Do, they, do you, if it's a bigger case, you talk to them about the case before you're going to go try to go to mediation so that they can put their two cents in and they can uh, have some idea of what's going on and what and what, kind of what the case value is. And so they don't just get a big surprise. A surprise in a bad way if the case didn't turn out as much as as they were hoping it would. Well, and that's why you call it a partnership, too. It's yeah. not a partnership if you're doing everything and you're not keeping your referral attorney engaged in any of it or updated in any of it. So yeah. it's a true partnership. Absolutely. And, you know, we've been blessed with great people. And, you know, and you have to give them what they want. Like some of our referring lawyers want a meeting every month where we go over the cases with them, and that's fine. And actually, those usually work out really well for both parties because, one, they know what's going on. Uh, but two, they're often, a lot of our referring lawyers in other cities, they often talk to the clients. We, we try to make sure we talk to them at least once a month, but they're often seeing the clients more than we are. Uh, they often know more things about the medical treatment before we do. They know something about the client. Maybe the client would tell them something that they would tell us. So we learn things there. And invariably, we have those meetings, and then every meeting, second or third meeting, oh, by the way, we've got a couple other cases we want to talk mm-hmm. to you about. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's good for both of us. Other people really just, really and truly just want to know when the check's coming in. They don't want to, they like, I sent it to you because I want you to do it. I don't want to be bothered with it anymore. And we respect that too. But most people at least want to, maybe not monthly, but want to have some check-in, some idea what's happening on the case. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. One of the things we did this year is we combined our marketing and our intake department. So we had people in intake were kind of working on the, what I would call the case management end. I mean, our regular firm manager was supervising them, and they were kind of, you know, it was intake and legal assistance kind of being in the same unit. And now we moved intake being supervised by you, our marketing director, instead of being supervised by the main firm manager. Uh, What do you think about that? So, first of all, I love it. (laughs) Um, I'm really happy that we did that because I saw our marketing efforts to a certain extent I knew cases were coming in, but now that I manage the intake department, I can see the type of cases that are coming in. I can assist when I need to. If there's some issue, as soon as a case comes in, I can jump on it right away. And because I'm a part of the process when we develop that relationship with the referral attorney, it just makes it so much easier for me. I I think it's also helping prioritizing because you used to get excited because, oh, someone, you know, so-and-so sent us a case. And then you find out so-and-so said it's a case that we would never want. Yes. Uh, and it's not the kind of case we do. Mm-hmm. 
and you know we find like okay this person's been sending us things but none of them are what we want you know that person's not as valuable and Yes. As, from a marketing perspective, not that they're not... Right, everyone's valuable. <laughs> but and not that we don't want to be friends with them, but as far as, you know, when we're prioritizing, you know, wh- how we're doing some of these really exotic, expensive experiences we're providing for people, mm-hmm. you know, someone that just doesn't have what we want, like I said, doesn't mean we can't go do something together, but it means we're not going to go spend, you know, ten fifteen thousand yeah. dollars taking them on some magic well, special trip. And it went from, because we're talking about how important it is to assess your marketing efforts and what's working... Um, it went from seeing these referral attorneys with numbers next to them and knowing them personally to actually seeing what those numbers are. So now I can see, okay, we have one referral attorney who sends us 20 cases in a year, and then we have another referral attorney who sends us five cases in a year. And before, those are just numbers to me. But now that I manage intake, I can see those numbers differently. I can see them in the cases and what the value of those cases are. So I look at those numbers so much more differently than just on an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, and for one of our referring lawyers, I'm thinking of, for example, he probably only spends you know four to six cases a year, but those cases are mm-hmm. worth so much more than the average case because we have yes. a developed relationship where he's a really good lawyer and for most of the cases we do he can do himself just fine but because of our long relationship there's some really big monster cases that are going to cost a lot of money and need a lot of effort that he brings us in on and frankly if we only had those cases I mean if, if it was just you know Mallory, Sonia, and I in his four to six cases a year, we'd probably make yep. a pretty good living. Uh, <laughs> It'd be scary, but you're right. You're very right. Because, uh, you know, we've been blessed with someone that's, that's sending over, you know, multiple seven-figure cases multiple times a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and thank you. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you very much. But, yeah, that was something I, I really enjoyed. And I also think for anyone who's listening to this podcast who doesn't have an internal marketing um, professional, it's always important to to think about what you're doing with your marketing and then also look at the cases that you have coming in as one one big mound of information and not looking at them separately because what I was doing last year was looking at them separately. But now that I'm looking at them together, the way I'm assessing what's working, what's not, and, and where our different referral attorneys are in that referral um, list is so much differently. I see it so much more clearly now. So I, I hope people listening to this will do the same. And if you are, you know, and for most of my career, I did not have an internal marketing director. And even when I did, it took a lot of, a lot, I had to kiss a lot of frogs to find a princess. Uh, you know, it took a lot to find you. We went through a number of people that were not you. Um, is track relationships. I mean, and, mm-hmm. and I tried doing it, and I, and I would fall off and get back on. But, you know, just keep a spreadsheet. Look at who are your most important referral partners and then make a goal for how often you're going to have a, a touch or a contact with that person and track it. And then you'll see, hey, it's been, you know, over 30 days since I've seen this person. Let me call them and see if they want to have lunch. Mm-hmm. We had someone on the show who said they do that. And when I listened to that podcast, I was like, oh, they're so right. That's so important. So I loved that they did that. Yeah, we actually have a needles marketing case called Contact Referring Lawyers. I just mm-hmm. haven't been doing it because I've got you, and I don't yeah. have to. But I'll be your needles checklist reminder. But it's still, but it's still something I need to do. I mean, I have mm-hmm. to get off my butt and travel and go have lunch and meet with people. Because uh, if I don't, even even if you had a long, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty year relationship with somebody, if you don't tend to that relationship, it's just they don't necessarily think of you. And they're yep. again, you know, it's not it's. Like a marriage in that you have to give someone, you know, love and attention and respect. It's not like a marriage in that you don't have a vow of uh, fidelity to each other. There's mm-hmm. a real another word for that. My brain's not working. <laughs> well, and, and you know, so, so you, the, the person doesn't have. I mean, there's they have no obligation mm-hmm. to not work with somebody else. It's because it's that's not part of the deal. And so if you don't just re-earn their business constantly, someone else. We'll come and take it sooner or later. Well, and we have a couple of referral attorneys who used to refer to someone else, and now they refer to us. And that's a constant reminder to me that we could lose someone. And we you could. don't know when, so you have to tend to that relationship. Yeah. And there was always a reason that, you know, the people that had a long-standing relationship with someone else, and mm-hmm. we, we're actually pretty respectful of those. I don't go trying to poach right. uh, referring lawyers from another lawyer, but, you know, we were working a case along with the other person. The other person had frustrations in the relationship. The mm-hmm. other... The other, I guess, gaining lawyer or litigation lawyer did not 
tend to the relationship well, and they asked us, would we do a case? And we said yes, and all of a sudden that led to a series of cases, and unfortunately led to you know, some other people not getting as many cases. And but it was a lesson learned because now the customer experience is our client and also our referral attorney. Yep. You, know, you just have to just constantly be working at trying to give that experience, and then, you know, I think doing surveys is important. Um, I like the little survey monkey thing mm -hmm. uh, because it allows someone to give an anonymous feedback, and I think sometimes, you know, it's hard to get referring lawyers to so sometimes do it. I almost have to call everyone yeah. asking, I'm going to send this. It's really important. I want to make sure I'm giving you good, a good experience. But sometimes people will tell you things when they can do it anonymously that they would not tell you because of, because of the relationship. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They don't want to rock the boat. And you really want to know when you have those little things that irritated somebody, even if it's just a little thing, because if you can mm -hmm. fix it, you know, that next case could be a case with a million dollar fee. Or mm -hmm. even if it's just a case with a $10,000 fee. I mean, to learn that you know you could have used had someone in your office use a different tone of voice on a phone call yeah. or just gone to have lunch with somebody to smooth something over and not lost that money it's really a good return on investment well and i think that's something i really enjoy about my job is because sometimes someone will feel more comfortable telling me something like that versus telling you because it's always hard to say something like that to yeah. someone's face um so that's something i really enjoy about our relationship is the referral attorneys do feel comfortable sharing that with me too and i think that's Part of the reason why I also enjoy the one-on-one -on -one connections we have with our referral attorneys because it gives them a chance to tell us if we can improve somewhere. And so another thing we've been trying to do is just, uh, you know, I don't work with any quote-unquote legal marketing firms because I find that a lot of people that do legal marketing do, you know, triple the price for half the results of, of non-legal marketing. Yeah. Uh, I think we lawyers are kind of viewed as suckers in the marketing world, rich suckers, mm -hmm. or at least they think we're rich. We don't, a lot of us aren't, but we, compared to a lot of other small businesses, the lawyers have disposable income, and we always seem to be suckers for the next shiny object syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, so what are some things that we've done to try to avoid getting ripped off and to find uh, people who do good work at a price that's fair? So we have a relationship with a marketing company that doesn't have a lot of legal clients, and that was on purpose. And when I first started with you, we started with a company that did only legal marketing. And I understand exactly why you said what you just said, because I thought, well, my gosh, we paid so much money, and I didn't feel like we got the quality that we deserved. Um, our, our cases. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it didn't work. Again, going back to the assessment part, it was clearly not working, so we had to And their solution out. was always, we just need to spend more money. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, man, it was like a money pit with them. So um, I think for us, what we learned was reaching out to individuals who don't have um, very much, if any, legal in their background. And it's not just with our marketing efforts only. Um, we also hired a graphic designer locally on a contract basis to help us with visuals for our cases when we're preparing for trial. And having her work with us and not have a legal background actually helped because it helped us understand when we were creating a visual that someone who doesn't have a legal background could not understand. Um, and I, I really enjoyed using her for that reason because sometimes we get too close to something and we don't want to look at it from that perspective. And having someone without a legal background tell us, oh, I don't understand that, made so much sense. Yeah, I think the only drawback to having somebody without a legal background working on your marketing team is they don't necessarily understand how people in your target audience think and make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, our target audience is other people plaintiff's attorneys and so one thing we've had to do is that you know we've had people suggest things to us that quite frankly would be insulting to our audience because yeah. you know that's it's hard sell stuff I mean we can never suggest that you know the lawyers we work with couldn't do it themselves or right. aren't good enough to do it themselves because they are frankly uh, it's just a lot of it is you know if they wanted to spend if they had the time and money to spend to master something at the expense of not being able to do all the things they're doing very well in their practice because you can't do everything at once. There's a, a finite hours a day. Most of them could do it. We work with some brilliant people. Right. Uh, the fact is it makes more sense for them to let us do what we're really good at while they specialize, while they keep doing what they're really good at and 
they end up making more money and working a fewer hours that way. Uh, but getting someone to understand how to message to something that will persuade someone to work with you without turning them off or insulting them yeah. has been a challenge. I think the same thing for, you know, I think there is a lot of lack of uh, understanding a lot of the, the online marketers and how potential personal injury clients actually make decisions. Um, and, you know, there's a reason why quote unquote cheesy TV ads are what mo- a lot of the TV lawyers do mm-hmm. because they work. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we had Jim Adler on the show, we talked to him, the Texas Hammer. You know, he's he tried doing a kinder, gentler thing because people were criticizing his ads and other lawyers were giving him a hard time. And he tried to do something that would be more popular with the lawyers, and the phone stopped ringing. Mm-hmm. Well, and from a marketing perspective, when I listened to that episode, I was like, so that's why he never changed it. Because I always wondered, well, why doesn't he change it from the Texas Hammer to something else? Or why doesn't he smile and more of his commercials? And little did I know when he actually tried to do something different, the phone stopped ringing. So it made sense for him. Yeah, because when you talk to him, he's a really intelligent, really calm, down-to-earth guy. Yes. But he's got to you know, he's got to play the part on TV because mm-hmm. uh, that's what gets him the cases. And, yeah. And not to say there's not a part of him that's not that, but he's just not a big yeller and you know no he's not he I I enjoyed listening to his podcast yeah so why do you think it's important to do all this you know before the beginning of the year to do all this at the end of the year every year I think it's important because you have to have a plan for the next year um, and also for budgeting purposes at the beginning of every year you should have a blood a budget and you should have a plan Um, And if you don't do all this stuff in November or in December, then you're starting off January wondering, well, what the heck am I going to do? And how much money do I have to spend? Um, And essentially when you're doing something like this, you also find out and think to yourself, well, what worked and what didn't? And you can try and determine what should I be doing in the next year versus what's not going to happen again because it wasn't successful. Yeah, you really do need to find some way to measure your return on investment. And, you know, some ways it's easier in, like, direct-to-consumer because you could have, like, a different phone number or a different website mm-hmm. for different types of ads, whereas, you know, we have to rely a little bit more on did we already have a relationship with somebody. Right. If not, just asking them, you know, by the way, how did you hear about us? What made you decide to mm-hmm. work with us? And uh, But, yeah, it's important to do that. If not, uh, the other thing I think that's really important is to, and, and we haven't done this yet, but we're working on this week, is to have a calendar of what you're going to do when because it's so easy to get so busy working on your current cases that you forget to market for next year's cases right uh and then all of a sudden like three months have gone by you haven't you know marketing has to be consistent and you haven't done anything and you then you do like another batch of it then you get busy working your case again you don't do anything anymore and, and i think it's if you plan it out and have those regular reminders you actually get things done well, and I thought it was interesting today when we were talking about the different seminars where we want Trial Lawyer Nation to be a sponsor, when we listed out the organizations and then we listed the dates, I was like, well, shoot, some of these dates are months where I want us to be doing something else. So now I know the month before this is going to be really busy for us because we have a lot of planning to do. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Only other thing I can say, you know, if you have the budget to be one of the top three advertisers in your market and you have the infrastructure to handle all the calls you're going to get from that, then by all means, you know, advertise to the public at large. If not, find your niche. Find a group. And for us, it's other lawyers. I know other people. It's the churches they go to and the pastors they work with. I know other people. It's the bicycling community or the motorcycle community because they're very active in that community and people get them. Uh, other people I know get it through scouts or rotary that's more business to business but uh, you know find your niche find some place where you can be the the one that people think of and then tend those relationships and keep those people happy it's not enough just to send things out you have to ask for business and then you have to treat people very well when they're nice enough to give it to you I'd end by saying a lot of people know the phrase ABC always be closing I think attorneys should consider ABM, always be marketing. Especially in the legal industry, you never know when you'll have a great month where there's lots of new business coming in and when you'll have a slow month where there's hardly any cases. And maybe it's not a month, maybe it's a few months. But just because you have some great months doesn't mean you should slow down with your marketing. We're fortunate because you can always co-counsel with another attorney like you to help out during those times where you've got a lot of cases coming in 
But what you can't do is predict when those slow months are going to happen. So the way you fix that problem is continue with your marketing at all times, and that will help you during those slow months. The other thing I hear a lot is attorneys will say, well, I don't have the time to market, or I'm going to cut money in my marketing budget. First, you have to make time for marketing. You just have to. There's no shortcut around that. If you don't make time to market, then how do you expect to have new business coming into your office? And then whenever someone talks to me about reducing their marketing budget, I think of the Henry Ford quote, stopping advertising to save money is like stopping your watch to save time. For the attorneys who are looking at their bank accounts and they're wondering where to cut money, I would ask them to think of that quote before they take it from marketing. If you reduce your marketing budget and you still expect cases to come in the door, then you need to ask yourself, what am I doing to ensure new business will continue to come in when I take money from marketing? And if business is slow, maybe you should be taking some money out of your marketing budget, but maybe you should evaluate your marketing strategies like we talked about earlier in this podcast and just take away money from the strategies that aren't working anymore. But if you're trying to cut your budget down and think taking money from marketing will save you money, yeah, it might save you money right away, but it will hurt you when the next month or the next quarter you see a reduction in your business. Well, thanks, Lucy. I've enjoyed talking to you and we're going to keep working on this stuff this week i hope uh y'all who've been listening today have gotten something out of this if you have any questions uh please email them to us at podcast at triallawyernation.com thank you and we look forward to talking to you and answering any questions you may have about marketing thank you for joining us on trial lawyer nation I hope you enjoyed our show. If you're listening to this episode on a mobile device, please click on Ratings and Review and leave our show a five-star rating and write a review. And if you're listening to this episode from our website, please leave a five-star rating on the episode page. We'd love to reach more listeners, and doing this will help more attorneys find this podcast. You can also visit our website at www.triallawyernation.com to opt into our mailing list so you can stay updated on our new episodes. I promise we won't spam you. And thanks to your feedback, we've improved our podcast website. There's now a resources tab that you can click that shows you all the books we've mentioned on our podcast. If you have a Facebook account, please send us a request to join our private group called Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle. This exclusive group will allow you to hear about our guests before an episode airs, interact with the show, and get a sneak peek at some of the behind the scenes moments. I love to hear from all of you, and our Table Talk episodes are based solely on questions from our fans. So please continue to send us emails at podcast at triallawyernation.com. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking, commercial motor vehicle, and product liability cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We would be honored to review the case in detail, discuss where we believe we can add value, and create a mutually beneficial partnership. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.